Hello, and thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Greetings, and thank you for joining us. Go ahead and use the chat feature to tell us where you're joining from. Thank you all for joining. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello, and thank you for joining us. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The nurse planner and content experts for this content have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. To receive contact hours for this NCPD session, participants are required to attend the webinar and log into our learning management system to complete an evaluation form. 
Information on how to access this will be emailed to all attendees within one week after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, if we have time, we'll have a question and answer session. You'll see on your Zoom webinar control panel that you can send a message through the Q&A feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to pose to our presenter. Be sure to hit send so the message makes it to us. Please use the Q&A feature for questions and the chat feature to interact with other participants. We are thankful to partner with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to bring you this webinar today. We'd like to thank our speaker for sharing her expertise. Of note, thoughts and views expressed are that of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect that of Sigma. Our speaker today is Dr. Josie Bidwell. Dr. Bidwell serves as an Associate Professor and Clinical Director for the Department of Preventative Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She is board, a board certified diplomate of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and was inducted as a fellow of the college in 2022. She is the first nurse to receive this designation. Dr. Bill Bidwell currently practices in the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at UMMC and hosts the live weekly call-in radio show Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. We are so excited to have you with us today and we're going to turn it over to our speaker. Wonderful. I'm so happy to be here and to be speaking with all of you about a topic that is incredibly important for healthcare in general. I think it fits perfectly in with what we do as nurses and something that, you know, has really given me a lot of satisfaction in my job role and, you know, feeling like I'm making um, a wonderful impact in patient lives. So I hope that you will fall a little bit in love with lifestyle to medicine today as we go throughout these um, slides. And uh, as they mentioned, you know, go ahead and drop questions in the Q&A feature and we'll, we'll get to those. So I could talk about lifestyle medicine all day long, every day. So I have to uh, pick the things that I want to talk with you about today. And so those things are going to be just a kind of an introduction to lifestyle medicine and what the six pillars of lifestyle medicine are. And then I want to talk a little bit about the scientific evidence that supports the utilization of these pillars in the prevention or treatment or reversal of chronic disease. Um, you have to understand the process of how we get evidence-based lifestyle assessments in order to be able to compose relevant uh, lifestyle prescriptions. And so those are the last two things we'll talk about is how we start to do assessment of these issues and then how we actually craft uh, prescriptions uh, related to lifestyle for individuals. So what is lifestyle medicine? I mean, when I first started uh, doing presentations like this, no one had heard of lifestyle medicine. And so I'm so glad that uh, we're, uh, it's becoming more mainstream. People are understanding the terminology around lifestyle medicine and beginning to see um, the power that lifestyle truly has in uh, disease treatment and reversal. So lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle intervention as a primary modality, right? And that's an important kind of thing to, to highlight or underline is that it is a primary modality. It is not um, just a, a handout that we give folks that say, you know, work on your diet and exercise or something that we try for three months. And if that doesn't work, we progress to medications. It is always lifestyle plus. Lifestyle belongs at each phase of um, prevention, treatment, and reversal. And so some of the things we work on are things like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, but really it, it runs um, a complete spectrum of disorders that are applicable to be treated with lifestyle medicine. Um, I see a variety of patients in, in clinic each day, and that's one of the things that keeps it so interesting is just the, the varied amount of conditions that we can uh, use this um, 
this set of evidence on. Um, so lifestyle medicine certified clinicians, uh, which um, I'm one, where other nurse practitioners, physicians, physical therapists, psychologists, registered dietitians, um, is very multidisciplinary. Um, but we're trained to apply evidence-based whole person prescriptive lifestyle change. And so that's an important concept, again, that everything we recommend is grounded in good science. So it has a lot of evidence behind it um, that we do tend to look at and approach the person in the totality of their life, not just what we're seeing in the exam room. And then it's truly prescriptive, just like I would write a prescription for uh, you know, uh, uh, an antihypertensive, I'm going to write prescriptions for these lifestyle interventions. And when we use them intensively, and I'll talk later about the appropriate dosing of lifestyle and why that is so important, uh, when we use these things intensively, we can often put things into remission or um, reverse them. So I mentioned the pillars of lifestyle medicine, and there are six pillars um, of, of lifestyle medicine, and we'll get to each one of those and go through them. But kind of briefly, it is whole food plant predominant eating, and I'll talk about what that is, um, a focus on physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, the avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connections. And We've talked about treatment and reversal, but these are also appropriate to apply as um, uh, prevention strategies. I mentioned that we're always grounded in strong evidence, and I just want to make sure that we highlight that again, um, that everything that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is going to endorse is going to have um, the, the evidence behind it and supporting it. Lifestyle medicine is highly effective. Um, it produces great outcomes and it's often delivered at a lower cost than some of our uh, more traditional medical uh, modalities. We do work at addressing the root cause of disease. And I mentioned that it's very interdisciplinary and that is really important. I'm lucky enough to work with a, um, a team of other nurse practitioners. Um, I have medical residents that are on my team, uh, physical therapy, clinical psychologists, um, exercise physiologists, um, uh, just a whole host of folks. And each one of those disciplines brings a, a a unique value to the lifestyle medicine team. Um, again, here's those six pillars and we're going to go through each one, but I want to hang out for a second on the whole food plant-based or whole food plant predominant um, pillar. That uh, is an area of a lot of focus and I hope you'll see why as I start to present some of the, the evidence uh, behind nutrition, uh, but at the root of it, what we are talking about is the majority of your plate and your intake as plants. A lot of times when the word plant-based is used, we think about the plant-based products that we're seeing on the shelves, which a lot of those are highly processed uh, products as well and would not necessarily fall into this whole food um, uh, focus of, of, um, of, a, of a whole food plant predominant uh, lifestyle. So we, we always wanna eat, um, as unmissed with as we can in terms of food and very plant forward. So again, the remainder of those pillars are restorative sleep, which is actually my favorite one to talk about uh, because it is so very important. Uh, physical activity, avoidance of risky substances like tobacco products, other um, uh, recreational drugs and alcohol, uh, stress management, and then positive social connections. And it is a truly um, kind of cross-cutting pillar for all of these other pillars because social connection is so foundational um, to our sense of identity as humans, as well as our um, self-efficacy and uh, support in being able to make some of these changes that we're going to talk about. So why now? Why are we starting to hear more and more about lifestyle medicine? Because it, there is an urgent need for healthcare providers in general to understand the uh, scientific underpinnings of lifestyle and be able to apply those to our patients within our healthcare system. 
Um, so just looking at uh, kind of U.S. data, the national cost of chronic and mental health conditions, 90% of the $4.1 trillion we spend on that is related to people with chronic conditions and, and other mental health conditions. That is a huge chunk of our healthcare spending um, that we are sending into to chronic health. And we've got to explore all of the tools in our toolkit to be able to um, continue to take care of a, an aging population and a population that continues to um, develop more and more chronic illness. Uh, these are the top 10 causes of actually uh, mortality and morbidity in the United States. And we've put stars beside the ones that have a very clear lifestyle underpinning to them. Um, so heart disease remains the number one um, here in the U.S. and globally. Um, and then you've got cancer, COVID, uh, which, of course, is just going to be on um, on charts dating back to, to 2020. Um, you've got unintentional injuries, stroke chronic lower respiratory disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and then liver and kidney issues. And what I'd like to call your attention to here, if you can, um, if you look at the end of the little bars, right, the blue bar is 2020, the green bar is 2021. If you look at those numbers um, and you look at uh, the little superscript in front of it, there's a one in front of some of those numbers and then there's a two um, in front of some of the others. The one is indicating that there is a statistically significant increase in that from the previous year. So if you look at heart disease, there's an increase. If you look at cancer, there is a statistically significant increase. And for most of these things, we're seeing that. The ones that have a two in front are statistically significant decrease, right? And so um, there is a little bit of a decrease in the chronic lower respiratory disease, so your COPD type um, um, diseases, and in Alzheimer's. Um, but the majority of these lifestyle related, um, or at least the lifestyle component diseases um, are continuing to rise. And I would like to, for us to think about lifestyle medicine as standard of care. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you why, um, because it truly is um, the, the standard of care when you think about clinical practice guidelines. When we look at a multitude of chronic diseases, whether that be diabetes or hypertension or high cholesterol, and you pull clinical practice guidelines, the first step that it's going to tell you to do is lifestyle modifications, right? So if we look over here, um, all the way to the left of your screen is diabetes care, and there's the whole standard of medical care in diabetes that is uh, has a focus on lifestyle management. Right. Um, the one all the way to the right is looking more at um, at heart disease and at angina. Um, and again, it's saying folks with stable angina can be managed with lifestyle changes that focus on smoking cessation and regular exercise um, and that it should be the foundation of, of of what we're doing. And then this last one here is looking at ASCVD risk and the use of cholesterol medications and the lowering of, of cardiovascular risk here. And if we just spend a second right there um, at, at this number one, it says in all individuals emphasize a heart healthy lifestyle across the lifespan or across the life course. And then those things include um, talking about nutrition and developing intensive lifestyle efforts. And that's another important word to remember is that word um, intensive. Uh, and, and we'll talk about why that's a little bit different than just traditional health counseling um, as we go along. So if we stop right now and just kind of think back to, to what we've talked about so far, so far, I hope you can see the need for us being able to adopt lifestyle medicine into mainstream healthcare, uh, where we are all practicing it to a certain degree, because truly we are um, being held to those standards of care in the, um, the provision of lifestyle information and counseling to our patients. And a lot of times it's not about what we say to people, it's about how we say it and how we coach um, individuals into uh, making that behavior change. 
So what is the, is the good science behind some of these pillars? Well, we'll start by just uh, putting lifestyle medicine at the center of all of these things and realizing the fact that lifestyle medicine is um, part of multiple dimensions of, of medicine and of science. Um, we draw from, of course, heavy from nutrition. We draw from um, um, the field of psychology a lot as well with a lot of motivational interviewing, goal setting uh, and true behavior change there. Uh, we're gonna pull in concepts from exercise physiology and kinesiology, um, as well as your true physiology of how the heart, pancreas, kidneys, liver, all of those things work. And so when you're looking for um, articles on life, on the effectiveness of lifestyle interventions and those kinds of things, it's not just um, Googling lifestyle or putting lifestyle into to PubMed. Um, it's about incorporating really the, the breadth of information that is around all of these uh, major um, contributors to our medical knowledge and, and medical science in general. We also always want to have social determinants of health as a um, an umbrella that we are looking at all of these things through. When I'm working with someone on nutrition, um, I'm never going to assume that they have access to um, these fresh things that we're talking about or to a grocery store at all or the finances and being able to do that. So we always have to approach the pillars um, with social determinants of health in our uh, in our mind and at the forefront of what we're doing so that we truly build sustainable change for individuals. All right, N nutrition and diet. We could camp out here um, all day and have multiple webinars just on uh, the, the importance of nutrition and the importance of diet um, in our overall health. But I do want to call attention to um, this particular chart here and what we're looking at. Um, we are looking at uh, across the bottom, disability adjusted life years. So in essence, um, the number of years lost uh, secondary to disease, disability, or premature death. And if we look at risk factors on the left, the major risk factor that is contributing to the, the highest percentage of these uh, disability adjusted uh, life years is diet. And when we break that down a little bit but further, you know, what is that actually meaning? Well, the, the risks that are greatest or contributing the most are those dietary patterns that are low in fruits, low in nuts and seeds, high in processed meats, low in vegetables, and then high in trans fat. Um, so uh, we tend to call that a traditional Western pattern here in the States. We'll often call it a, a standard American diet. Um, but that way of eating uh, that has very little focus on plant food and more focus on processed or animal-based products um, does contribute more risk to uh, loss of quality life or um, disability. So what about globally and looking at the kind of global burden of, of disease and how nutrition can play a role in that. Well, if we look at uh, the global burden of disease study and looking at 15 foods and nutrients for adults, uh, adults over the age of 25, and looking at, at data from 195 different countries, these are some of the things we start to see. Dietary factors accounted for 11 million deaths in 2017 from non-communicable disease okay? and 25 million disability adjusted life years. So in essence, those life, life years lost, those quality years lost. And the death impact was more than smoking right, which has, is largely heralded as a, you know, significant public health concern and contributing to a lot of preventable um, death and disability, but, but dietary impacts actually had a, a greater impact on things. 22% of deaths and 15% of those disability adjusted life years. And if we break that down even further into more specific nutrients, um, just a high sodium diet, um, as well as um, looking at um, 
actually if we, we hang out a little bit with the with the sodium, we're going to see you know, 3 million deaths um, looking at sodium. And if you look at your graph here, you can start to see diets low in whole grains, diets low in fruits, diets low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables. So all of these um, diets that are low in plant forward um, ingredients are contributing to um, excess you know, death and disability. All right. There we go. All right, food choice and life expectancy. So if we change, if we start to make um, adjustments to our nutritional intake, does that matter? Is there a point where it's too late? Those are, are some of the things that I hear from patients. Um, this particular um, study is actually a, a modeling study. So looking at um, expected change based on dietary patterns. And so it's looking at three diets and you may say, well, Josie, I only see two diets talked about on here. You've got typical Western and optimized diet. Um, so I, I kind of already mentioned what a typical Western diet is, something that's uh, relatively high in saturated fat, sodium, um, animal products, low in fruits, veggies, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. An optimized diet, as defined in this particular study, uh, was substantially higher fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, fish, some nuts, and a significant reduction in red or processed meats, refined grains, and sugar-sweetened beverages, right? And so if we think about those things as kind of sitting um, at opposite ends of a spectrum, right, a, a quote-unquote unhealthy diet and a much uh, healthier diet, um, they actually looked at a midway point, which they're calling a feasibility diet, which was just kind of smack in the middle uh, of those two extremes there. Uh, and that mattered. Uh, we actually saw improvements at the feasibility diet. But let's hang out uh, here at the, you know, if we go completely from the traditional Western diet to more of the optimized diet pattern, what do we see? Well, if that happens at age 20, uh, life expectancy for women uh, goes up almost 11 years, for men, 13 years. Uh, what if we find this way of eating a little bit later in life at age 60? Um, again, eight years of increased life expectancy for women, almost nine years for men. And then what if we're late to the game? Like it's, it, we're at 80 years when this change happens. Is it even worth making this change? Um, yes, um, you still see a life expectancy increase of 3.4 years for both men and women here. Um, uh, together. Um, and the biggest gains were found when more legumes were consumed, more whole grains and more nuts, and less red meat and processed meat. So I mentioned that um, feasibility diet, that midway point diet, if that's adopted at age 20, we actually see a gain of um, 6.2 years for women and 7.3 years uh, for men. Uh, and so as a mom of teenagers who don't always consume the healthiest diet, I'm, I'm holding out that there's, there's still time um, for them to continue to make progress and moving toward uh, more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains, uh, and more legumes. Because the take home from this slide is that it's about progress over perfection. And that's something that I work with um, my patients a lot with, um, as well as that it's never too late to start to make these changes that have significant improvements in your overall uh, health and wellness. All right. That was, that was nutrition, some of the evidence behind nutrition. And like I said, we could spend multiple hours digging through all of the evidence that supports a whole food plant predominant way of eating uh, but there are other pillars, and I want to make sure that we address some of those as well. Um, so physical activity, if we start actually on the right side of your screen, uh, I picked just brain health. So if we want to just look at how adjustments and physical activity um, can impact our brain health, um, the evidence is, is pretty strong as well. And I also want us to make sure that we are paying attention to the fact that even um, acute or, you know, short bouts of exercise are beneficial. So if you look at that um, chart there, which is directly from the um, physical activity guidelines for Americans, uh, the most recent edition that we have, 
Um, you'll see a column that says acute, meaning kind of immediately after exercise, and then you'll see habitual. So those are the benefits that we start to see when physical activity becomes um, a routine part of our, our daily life and our, our health and wellness journey. So for kids, uh, children six to 13, they have improved cognition, um, especially on academic tests, processing speed, memory, all of those things with acute exercise. Um, that's why you may start to see in um, classrooms, people start to have more brain breaks or um, a, um, active learning activities because it matters, even that a, a acute phase of, of exercise there. Um, moving on down toward a, uh, adults for acute benefits especially for brain health, we've got reduced short-term feelings of anxiety. So that kind of acute anxiety um, uh, situation, uh, exercise is beneficial for that, as well as improved sleep outcomes, right? And the, the more the acute episode of, of physical activity is, the, the better sleep outcomes we see from that. And then once we start to add these things uh, more habitually um, and make them part of our routine, the benefits just continue to increase, right? So uh, we, we continue to have improved cognition, reduced risk of Alzheimer's and um, improved quality of life, reduced risk of depression, and again, more long-term signs of uh, and symptoms of anxiety uh, with and without a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And those sleep outcomes, including um, sleep efficiency, you know, how much time we sleep in, how much time in the, we spend in the bed sleeping versus other things in the bed, um, like reading, watching television, those types of activities, uh, as well as um, the frequency uh, of medication to aid sleep. All of those things are improved with um, a habit of regular physical activity. Um, here in the States, we use the, the guidelines of uh, 150 minutes uh, of moderate intensity physical activity per week as kind of our general guideline. And that was a lot of public health messaging for uh, a long time. And that is, that's fine. There's evidence to back that up. What became an unintended kind of consequence of that is people perceived that there was little benefit if they were unable to achieve that amount, right? And we generally parcel that out as 30 minutes a day, five days of the week. I mean, that's just not necessarily the case. And so this um, figure that you have all the way to the left actually shows you um, the number of metabolic equivalents across the bottom and then your hazard ratio of mortality um, on the left. And so if we think about a hazard ratio of one, meaning that there's, there's no difference, right? and a hazard ratio above one is gonna be an increased risk of something, a hazard below uh, one is gonna be a reduction in that. So if we think about mortality as our, our hazard, as what we're trying to avoid or decrease the risk of, there is a very steep um, slope from being not physically active at all to just starting. Right. I mean, before we even get to two or three metabolic equivalent um, hours per week, we are seeing significant uh, reduction in uh, in hazard uh, risk or hazard ratio for mortality. Um, so the take home for that is any movement counts. Right. I have written exercise prescriptions for patients that is for two minutes of exercise. And yes, that is suboptimally dosed in the long term. But in terms of getting people started, that is a completely appropriate way to to start things. Right. And so if we um, kind of start to see the, the curve even out, it's where we get into that 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. And then we do not see an increase in the hazard ratio when we get more than that, right? So any movement counts and you get big gains, um, big reduction in mortality risk when we um, uh, just start. So just, just do something. All right, restorative sleep. I mentioned sleep is my favorite and it, it truly is. Uh, the the uh, hormonal things that are in play and how that impacts our desired outcomes that we have, whether that be weight loss, or uh, improved blood pressure or better glycemic control, all of those things have um, a foundation in restorative sleep. And the word restorative is important uh, because that is the purpose of sleep. It should be restorative in nature. Um, the, that is the time for the body to 
um, repair itself. Uh, there are tons of uh, processes that are going on that are foundational to optimizing health and wellness that occur during sleep. Um, so I, I popped two studies in here uh, because they talk about two of my uh, favorite things to explain to patients, which are the um, uh, leptin and ghrelin. And the way I explain it to patients, leptin is your full and satisfied hormone. Um, ghrelin is uh, what we call the hangry hormone. And it's the one that just makes you feel not satisfied or like you need to eat something. Um, it can help drive cravings and just that, that feeling that you're, you're unsatisfied if you're not continuing to eat things. So in relationship to sleep, when we have a short sleep duration or just non-restorative in general, those two things become out of, out of balance with themselves. Um, if we look at this first study, looking at sleep restriction to four hours per day for six days, that leptin um, level reduced to that of someone who was starving, who was in a famine. Um, and so the calories weren't restricted, right? That's an important thing to, to um, be mindful of here is they didn't reduce calories to 900 calories a day, but that is where the leptin level fell to of someone who only had access to 900 calories or less a day. Um, and the physical activity wasn't adjusted, the calorie intake wasn't adjusted. So if we think of leptin as that full and satisfied hormone, and it is going significantly down, then the counter, counterbalance to that is we're going to feel unsatisfied and feel more like we need to consume more calories. Um, what if a shorter duration, right? Like not six days, but just kind of short-term sleep deprivation. So a sleep restriction, again, of four hours for just two days. Again, we see that reduction in leptin, that elevation in ghrelin, um, and an increased desire to eat. More hunger, an increased appetite, and especially for high carbohydrate foods, right? Um, and I don't mean high carbohydrate fruits and vegetables, much more... Um, uh, refined carbohydrate uh, products, um, whether that be um, baked goods, um, processed snacks, those kinds of things. So the take home here is that sleep loss impairs that hormonal control of our caloric need, right? Telling us how many calories we actually need in order to, to do the work of our body. And when we're feeling this way, we, and we have access to enough calories, right? So we're not in um, a, a famine or we're not in a, a food shortage type situation that leads to increased caloric intake um, and of largely less nutritious um, foods overall. And if we are, if we put that into a clinically relevant situation and we're working with patients who are desiring weight loss, right? Or who are um, concerned about their appetite or feel like they're always craving foods or that they need an appetite suppressant or any of those kinds of things, um, we want to make sure that we're addressing any underlying you know, biochemical reason that they could be feeling this way. So it makes it much harder to stick to a calorie restricted or lower refined product diet. And we tend to just tell people they need to have more willpower. And, and that's not it. Uh, they uh, actually need uh, a much more in-depth evaluation of, of their lifestyle and their sleep in particular. All right, what if we put all these together, right? Well, if we look at healthy uh, living factors or behavioral uh, health behaviors um, as a cluster of things, um, do we see reduction in uh, mortality and morbidity? This is the European Perspective Investigation Study. It uh, was uh, about 23,000 Germans, adults aged 35 to 65, with a relatively um, long follow-up time, almost eight years of follow-up. And they looked at their lifestyle behaviors, right? And assigned them points, right? One point for each of the following things. So if, you, if they had never smoked, got a point, right? BMI less than 30, got a point. And that's important to think about there. That a BMI of 30 is not what we would call a normal BMI, which I don't really like that word anyway, but um, what we would consider, um, you know, a normal weight, it would be um, 
in the overweight uh, category at a BMI less than 30. Um, three and a half hours of physical activity a week, which is 30 minutes a day, seven days of the week, uh, and healthy diet. And healthy diet was defined as uh, focus on the plants, more whole grains, lower focus on uh, meat. If you look um, at the, the columns, you'll see zero. That means they didn't have any of these uh, healthy uh, protective factors. And then of course, one, uh, one, two, three, and four of those factors across there. And then the selected uh, medical conditions underneath, you've got diabetes, um, all the way to cancer. And again, you'll notice that kind of uh, hazard ratio uh, on the left side. Um, you'll see zero lifestyle factors, not having any of these is that hazard ratio of one, right? And now we want to see if having these factors raises the risk or lowers. And if you just look at diabetes, look at that dramatic improvement with just one of those factors, right? Um, not all four, not having that, again, perfect um, healthy lifestyle plan, but just having one. And you see that continue um, across a multitude of these particular um, uh, chronic diseases. So participants with all four factors at baseline had a 78% lower risk of developing a chronic disease than participants without a healthy risk factor. So all four versus none, um, you see a dramatic reduction, but you do see improvements um, with even just one, two, three, or four of these lifestyle factors in place there. Again, progress over perfection. And then one of our favorite uh, studies to look at in terms of lifestyle medicine is the lifestyle heart trial, which if you are familiar with Dr. Dean Ornish, um, this was kind of his groundbreaking study that uh, was published in 1998. Uh, and it was very small, it was a very small study, um, but it looked at um, actual regression of stenosis of coronary arteries when uh, employing an intensive therapeutic lifestyle medicine approach, right? Um, and some important things to, to, to look at here you look at those three lines, the, the, the top one or the one with the, the triangle at the end of the line is individuals that were, you know, receiving just standard of care and, and no statin at this point. Um, the control all um, included statin use here. And then the one on the bottom is just the intensive therapeutic lifestyle change uh, with no statin on board. And those are pretty impressive results when you look at it. And what actually happened if you just compare intensive therapeutic lifestyle change to uh, just standard of care, no statin use, we saw, or not we, he saw um, regression of stenosis of the vessels at one year as well as at five years, whereas the standard treatment actually saw an increase in uh, stenosis at one and five years. And in terms of just anginal symptoms, um, a 91% reduction in the treatment arm of this and 165% increase in those symptoms in uh, the control. Uh, and so this uh, was foundational in beginning to uh, seek reimbursement for intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs. And that is why uh, now uh, the Ornish cardiac rehab program is one of the reimbursable cardiac rehab programs through Medicare. All right. What about in practice? How do we start doing these things? Because you've heard, like I've said good things. I hope you're kind of uh, interested in the science behind this and want to learn more about it. But how do we put these things into practice? Well, the important thing to remember is that lifestyle medicine fits into all types of clinical practices. It goes beautifully in primary care, um, but it also um, works in a variety of medical specialties like orthopedics or endocrinology, pediatrics, gynecology, and obstetrics, um, and for a variety of medical conditions. Um, uh, the number one thing that we see in our lifestyle medicine clinic is going to be hypertension and diabetes. And then very closely after that, we've got osteoarthritis of the knee or hip. We work with a ton of arthritis patients. Uh, and then fatty liver is coming along next. And then there's a whole host of other conditions that we work on um, in, in that um, spectrum. 
what we want to remember is that it is not just education or counseling, right? It is appropriately dosed therapeutic lifestyle uh, lifestyle, uh, interventions and change. Um, This particular study is looking at lifestyle interventions compared to just usual standard of of, of care, diabetes, education, and again, much more weight loss, much more um, uh, actually remission or reversal of diabetes when using the intensive therapeutic lifestyle change versus um, standard of care here. So it's not just a handout of here, eat this. It's really um, working with an individual to develop a plan. And the underlying things that we want to, to work on are a really good assessment. So identification of those underlying lifestyle risk factors and then prescriptions of treatments at a high enough intensity to affect healthcare outcomes. So these are two things that we use in our clinic. Um, All the way on the left is our new patient screening packet, the first page, which is a change ruler. We want to know where people are in terms of their stage of change and their desire to, to make a change or any barriers that they may have in being able to do that. Um, so we ask folks on a scale of zero to 10, how important is it to you to change one of these pillars and then how confident you are in being able to do that. Um, on the right side was a, a form that was given to me by a lifestyle coach Uh, at one point in time. I don't have where it originated from, but it is a a good way to get a general idea of what stage of change your patient is in. So let's say we picked um, a seven of importance and a seven of confidence. If we make those two things meet, that is in the range of preparation, right? Which that, those are the stages of change where we start to see people uh, mobilizing into to changing and being ready to do stuff. What is interesting about this particular uh, form is that there are 51 squares on here that would land you in pre-contemplation and only 49 that get you into contemplation or higher. And that's really important when we start to think about why people, um, are able to make change, right? When the majority of, of these squares are keeping us in, in, in our current way of being instead of moving forward. And that's largely from perceived barriers, health beliefs, those types of things. Nutrition assessment. We always want to use validated tools. Um, Here's the tool that we use in our clinic and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine does provide a list of validated tools for these different um, pillars of lifestyle. Um, We use the starting the conversation diet screener. It's eight questions um, and it just takes you through kind of big buckets of nutrition in terms of um, processed foods, sodium, uh, how many fruits and vegetables, those types of things. And then we also follow that up with uh, a 24 hour diet recall. Now, once people start to work with our dietitians, they may flex into um, a more uh, detailed uh, food journal or food diary, depending on the outcomes we're trying to achieve. But this gives us a good general overview of what people are consuming on on a routine day. In terms of physical activity, we use the exercise vital sign, or you may also see it as the physical activity vital sign. Uh, But at the heart of it, it's two questions. On average, how many days per week do you engage in moderate to strenuous exercise? And how many minutes do you do that? You multiply those together, and now you've got a a cardio number, right, that you can kind of uh, put up against that guideline of 150 minutes. And then there's the option to add the third question that looks at how many days a week do you perform muscle strengthening exercises like body weight or resistance. Again, gets us good, quick, quantitative data that we can write a prescription off of. Uh, For stress and well-being, we use the PHQ-4. You can also use the perceived stress scale, lots of other things that you can use, but the PHQ-4 combines the first two questions from the PHQ-9 for depression, uh, the first two questions from the GAD-7 for generalized anxiety, Um, and if they score anything but a zero on any of these, that should prompt a full GAD-7 or um, a full PHQ-9. For sleep, um, this is the global sleep assessment questionnaire. 
um, that goes through difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep? Um, are there things that are preventing you from going to bed? Um, thinking about pain and worry and stress, all of these things that impact sleep. I also ask a set of questions that asks about when do you get in the bed? What time do you fall asleep? Um, you know, do you wake up during the night? What time do you get up in the morning? I also ask, a, uh, how rested do you feel? Zero to 10. Zero is a zombie. 10 is full of energy. Uh, and then snoring. Because I'm trying to get at, is it a sleep hygiene issue uh, and a behavior issue? Or do we have an underlying sleep disorder that is uh, driving some of these things? For social connections, um, you can use the social support questionnaire. It is six questions with a sub-question under each one. Our EHR also has a built-in social connection screener um, that looks at the number of times you um, talk to someone on the phone, the number of times you uh, meet friends or family. Um, are you part of social or civic organizations? All of these types of things, because social connection, again, is such an important part of the overall success of the other pillars of lifestyle. And then risky substances, um, the TAPS tool part one uh, looks at tobacco, alcohol, uh, and prescription uh, drug use as well. Now getting into lifestyle prescriptions, this is a quick uh, lifestyle prescription pad that we have on uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website. Um, we uh, created this to just be really easy to use for folks to, to write um, prescriptions out there. But what we want to make sure we're doing when we're writing lifestyle prescriptions is that it is always patient-led. It is not about what I want for this individual. It is about what the patient desires, what their goals are, what they're trying to accomplish, and what they feel confident in being able to do. The dose matters. It truly does. And the way I explain this to folks is, uh, you know, if you um, had just had surgery and I gave you um, a children's dose of Tylenol for your pain control, your pain is not going to get better. That doesn't mean that that this particular medicine is not appropriate to treat this particular condition, it means I didn't dose it appropriately. Uh, and so the same thing is for lifestyle. If I say the words, eat more fruits and vegetables, that is not appropriately dosed, right? We have to actually dose these things out and make it smart. And uh, since we're all nurses, we uh, are probably familiar with the word smart goals um, as part of the uh, everybody's favorite uh, um care plan. Uh, but SMART goals is an integral part of what we do in lifestyle medicine. This is an example of common lifestyle advice on the side. Eat more fruits and vegetables, exercise more versus a much more therapeutically dosed out lifestyle prescription that maybe says, uh, you know, exactly the types of things that we're going to eat for breakfast and on what days we're going to do that. And we're going to add a walk um, for 15 minutes after lunch. And all of those have scientific basis, right? That walk after a meal helps with uh, uh, muscle uptake of glucose and lowering of insulin resistance. All of those things matter. So when we start to prescribe these things, this is the plate uh, method that is um, uh, developed by ACLM and it is a plant-based plate, fruits and veggies on half, plant proteins on a quarter and whole grains on the other quarter there, as well as a focus on hydration with water and using herbs and spices instead of salt to help flavor things. Um, and the benefit of this way of eating is that it is naturally lower in fat, higher in fiber, higher in water, which is going to make it lower in calories and much more nutrient dense. Um, but again, progress over perfection. So if we look at kind of that traditional Western pattern all the way to the left and that optimized diet all the way to the right, any movement from left to right here is a win. And so when we are writing prescriptions, we want to encourage uh, where people are confident in being able to move toward that optimized way of eating. Um, when we write a nutrition prescription, we want to think about the type of food, the amount of food, and the frequency of that food consumption. 
you can write a negative prescription or a positive prescription in terms of nutrition. I try to prioritize the positive. So instead of saying reduce this, right, maybe it's reduce soda, I'm going to write a positive prescription that is increasing water consumption. And how we do that is by swapping some of those sodas for water or using a sparkling water or fruit infused water or something like that. Uh, but an example of a food prescription or a nutrition prescription, again, looks like a, a medicine prescription we would write. I would say berries, half a cup daily for a breakfast or snack. All right, and I have all of these built into my EHR uh, so that I can pop them and print them out for patients uh, right at the time of the visit. In terms of physical activity, we want to make sure we know those guidelines, which I already mentioned, but I did put those on here for you as well, based on age group, depending on what age you work with, and how much aerobic versus muscle strengthening activity we need. And when we write a physical activity prescription, we use the component or the mnemonic FIT right? Frequency, intensity, time, and type. And the American um, College of Sports Medicine has a great prescription pad for use um, that is got all of this already written out for you, right? So you can pick the frequency, the intensity, the time, and type here for aerobic activity, for muscle strengthening activity. We want to be very specific with those things. Maybe it is walking, light intensity, 10 minutes, um, three days of the week, right? very um, easy to then evaluate whether we met that, uh, that goal, if we write it that way. In terms of sleep, there are so many factors that impact sleep. Um, again, sleep recommendations over here on the right. So adults, uh, somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep is the appropriate duration. Uh, one of the biggest impacts that we see on sleep is the presence of light in the room through devices, TV, cell phone, tablets, those types of things, and how that impacts the natural release of melatonin that helps to, to um, put us into restful sleep. And so we work a lot on adjusting that um, so that we uh, reduce that, that um, negative stimulus that is keeping us from sleeping. From a stress management perspective, there again are tons of different interventions that can be used for stress management. And that can be um, up to referral for um, you know, pharmacological management, or you can do pharmacological management, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, group counseling, all of those things. Uh, but the one that we like to use in clinic uh, the most uh, is abdominal deep breathing. And again, when I write that prescription for that, I'm very specific abdominal deep breathing, five minutes, twice daily. And I write this for people to practice every day, regardless of whether you're feeling stressed or anxious on that day, so that when you do feel that way, you're able to seamlessly transition into using this technique to help with your stress management. And then social connection. Um, there are tons of ways to do that, whether it be finding a group for individuals to, uh, to get plugged into. Um, we write a lot of prescriptions for book clubs uh, here or for um, going, uh, you know, getting reestablished in church or small group activity there and a lot of volunteering. Um, I have a, a, a gentleman who's pretty homebound or stays at home most of the time, but loves animals. Uh, we actually wrote him a prescription the other day for volunteering at the animal shelter um, to be able to work on things. And so I chose that here, volunteering 60 minutes um, uh, weekly uh, as his prescription. Uh, and, that's, and that's straight from him. And then again, your risky substance prescription. If you look down to your SMART goal um, here, it walks you through how to do that. And all of these resources that I've shown um, are available from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. These, these um, kind of handout uh, type things that you're looking at here, these are, are available for patient um, forward, patient facing use. Um, for that. Uh, and then lifestyle medicine in action. I, I could easily pull out cases of individuals who um, 
had a real easy time adopting all of these lifestyle factors and making all of these changes and adjustments and how great they did from a cardiometabolic standpoint. Um, but we actually just published um, in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine this case report of this individual who had much more difficulty adopting some of these things for a variety of reasons, transportation um, problems, being a caregiver for all other people in um, her family, um, lots of chronic pain, several autoimmune conditions. Um, and we followed her completely by telehealth over a span of, of uh, 15 months. And I want to just take a look at where we were when we started. Um, uh, BMI 42, blood pressure above goal, um, and where we wound up. So if I just put us down to where we wound up, Pre-lifestyle medicine, um, blood pressure range uh, or average was 143.9. Uh, Post-lifestyle medicine, 136.6. Diastolic decreased as well from 79 to 73. Um, blood glucose decreased from 140 to 131. And before, she had had about a 19-pound gain year over year. Um, and after we had had a halt in that and just very modest weight reduction. So I'll, I always want to remember that weight reduction is not our only marker of success. Um, that when appropriately tailored, um, even when multiple barriers are present, you can have clinically significant improvement in cardiometabolic outcomes. Now, the remaining slides that I have in here are just resources for you guys. So it's not really anything for us to cover, but different things that are available for you. The Lifestyle Medicine and Food is Medicine Essentials Bundle, um, which is uh, five and a half hours of free continuing education uh, for more lifestyle in, uh, medicine is completely free uh, with that code there. We also have um, remission and reversal of type 2 diabetes courses. Um, a supplement that was recently published in the Journal of Family Practice that has multiple components of lifestyle medicine, one that I wrote on shared medical appointments with Kelly Freeman, and then our reimbursement roadmap. And then the most important is that we're coming up on our annual conference in uh, Denver, and I hope I'll get to see some of you guys there if you stop by our booth and um, speak with me there. Um, I know we're almost out of time, but I think we probably have time for a question or two um, if we want to try and do that. I would definitely love to sneak in a few questions. Yeah, let's this has it. been so great. And uh, the feedback in the chat has been excellent. I appreciate that people are sharing their personal stories and being vulnerable with that. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. We love to see that. Um, in regards to the resources that American um, College of Lifestyle Medicine have, particularly the prescription slide or the pad that you use, mm -hmm. is that available in different languages currently or only in English? I believe that it's also available in Spanish. Um, I'm pretty sure it's available in Spanish, but I'll get um, them to, to confirm that for me and I can get you some links to those things as well. Wonderful. Thank you. So yeah. um, maybe whoever asked that question, if you want to send me an email, yeah. Linda at sigmanursing.org, then I can uh, get in contact with you once we have those answers. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, billing of insurance? What does that look like? And for ICD-10 codes, are you using the dietary surveillance ICD-10 code? And then what is the most beneficial time visit duration? How do you are, build all of that? Yes, those are <laughs> excellent questions. And, you know, our lifestyle clinic has been in operation for about five and a half years now. And uh, so we have we have done all of the different things. And I'll tell you what works the most. Uh, so we actually treat this just like a, a, a medical visit. So the ICD-10s that we are dropping are whatever uh, diagnosis we're treating. So if we are tailoring our interventions around hypertension or um, high cholesterol, diabetes, fatty liver, whatever that may be, those are the ICD-10s we use. We do also drop ICD-10s for nutritional counseling and exercise counseling as well, um, because we want to uh, uh, capture how important those things are to be delivered to the insurance companies. 
Uh, and then um, we build traditional evaluation and management codes. Um, so uh, level three, level four, level five, and we base uh, time, time based billing. So we bill based on the amount of time we spend with the patients. Uh, and that has changed over the years as well. Um, but at what we have found as the sweet spot is a 60 minute visit for new patients and a 30 minute visit for follow up. Um, is the way that we de deliver. Um, when we were completely telehealth, we were able to compress some of those new visits down into 30 minutes just because we didn't have the rooming and the vital signs and all of those different kinds of things there. But 60 minutes truly allows for the, um, uh, the, the best rapport building with that uh, individual. Wonderful. Thank you for answering those because yeah. sometimes those components get overlooked. Oh, you got to get paid. You got to get paid <laughs> to do it or you can't keep doing it. And and I really would encourage you to, to look at that roadmap for reimbursement because it goes through all of those models of being able to, to get reimbursed for lifestyle. And I want to just sneak in one more question and then we'll close out after you're done answering this. Is lifestyle functional medicine an independent practice option for NPs or do you have to have a collaborative, collaborative agreement or is it just state dependent? Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, it's going to be state dependent. Um, so here in Mississippi, we're a collaborative practice state. Um, so I have collaborating uh, physicians that I work with um, here in our department. Um, but if you are in an independent practice state, um, you should be able to establish um, without having a collaborative, depending on your insurers and your payers, what they require in terms of, of payment for primary care or any other office-based Billing. Wonderful. This has been so great. And unfortunately, we were not able to get to all of the questions. Email me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I will put your email um, in the chat for everyone. Um, and we want to thank you so much for all of this excellent information. And on the screen here, you can also see the websites and how to follow the American College of Lifestyle Medicine on the various social media platforms. So we want to thank you so much, Dr. Bidwell, for sharing all of this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with our audience. And we definitely Definitely look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Absolutely. We hope, we hope that you all enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, one week from today, you will obtain um, information and instructions on how you can obtain your nursing continuing professional development certificate. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars and other resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Thank you so much for joining us and have a beautiful day. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much.